Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, one of the first things I was going to say is that we are being recorded, uh, but I'm glad that the automated voice did that for us. Uh, if you have an issue with being recorded, you can obviously turn your video off. Uh, the recording is going to be used as a resource on the Fine Art website. Uh, welcome to today's Fine Art Lecture, the fifth in our series. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce to you today Maria Lavayova, who is the founding general and artistic director of Buck. Um, Buck is a, in informal terms perhaps, a very cool space in the Netherlands, uh, but more formally it's a uh, it stands for Basis for Aktuelle Kunst. So it's a space for art research and addressing the, the social and political urgencies of the present, which I'm sure Maria will tell you a lot more about. Um, I'll also just briefly explain to you the context within which her lecture is taking place. Um, I'm part of Fine Art. Fine Art is an innovative international training network. Um, examining the future of European independent art spaces in a time of socially engaged art. All of these terms, hopefully, we can break apart a bit in the Q&A after Maria's lecture. This uh, fine art program is jointly led by the University of Wolverhampton, the University Zeppelin University, the University of Iceland, and the University of Edinburgh. Uh, prior to this lecture, we had Kuba Schrader talk about interdependent curating. There will also be other lectures following this, which I'll indicate to you after Maria's lecture is over. For now, um, I wish you a very pleasant, engaging and inclusive, as well as perhaps generative lecture. And I hope we can engage in discussion after it. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so very much, uh, Sophie, for um, a generous introduction and for uh, hosting this session. And thanks to everyone who is facilitating the session today and all of you who, uh, who are joining uh, this talk. I'm going to see whether I'll manage to share my screen. And it should work if everything's all right, it should work. Thank you, of course, to Fine Art for the opportunity to speak within uh, uh, this series of public lectures that were actually designed to unfold the larger conversation about uh, the future of European independent art spaces in a period of social engaged art, as the title of this training platform um, has it. Now, indeed, I come into this conversation from, uh, from the field of institutional praxis, from what I like to think as an experimental space of an art institution, the hybrid mandate um, of which is situated somewhere the convergence of artistic practice, uh, knowledge production and social action. Or in other words, Bach finds itself perhaps or inhabits a variety of um, sort of transversal entanglements among the practices that we simply refer to as thinking, thinking how things are, imagining, imagining how things could be otherwise, and then seeking ways to contribute to materializing uh, of these alternative imaginaries or enacting or practicing or living these alternative imaginaries as if that were possible. Aside us for theoretically informed and politically driven imagination as practice. Now, with this in mind, uh, Bach has been envisioned as a base, a basis, uh, as is obvious from its full name, an understructure built to uphold and sustain practices of artists and other uh, cultural practitioners. Simultaneously, a base, this basis, so decidedly not a center, but a base, um, seeks to engage in the processes of decentering and off centering the art institution, seemingly paradoxically by the art institution itself. I just, Bach was founded in 2000 um, and it emerged from a composite of practices of socially engaged arts, tactical media, and institutional uh, critique from within the 1990s, inquiring um, whether and how an art institution itself could conduct institutional critique. And that is the critique of material and uh, immaterial conditions of uh, a for artistic production by eliminating within its own operation and reach to be sure social inequities and exploitative conditions for artists and other cultural practitioners, and then seek collaborative alliances with these artists and other cultural practitioners to drift perhaps, drift collectively towards 
what art theorist Marina Fischmetz calls infrastructural critique. And um, I'm quoting from this book um, uh, that I had the pleasure to co-edit together with writer and curator Tom Holler around, Holler around the practice of um, the remarkable um, Marian von Osten, who sadly passed away last year. Um, it was published in 2017, and it might be uh, an interesting and important, perhaps even read for our uh, researchers within this program. The notion of infrastructural critique, says Fischmidt, signals a view of the art institution as a site of resources, material and symbolic, and one that calls for an opportunist deployment for the sake of furthering all sorts of projects rather than the loyal criticism attendant, uh, attendant on institution critique in its established version. In this light, the construction of institutions may be at the same time a practice of institutional and infrastructural critique, depending on whether the institution is mainly intended to critically reassess or renew working conditions and visibility in the space of art or has other ambitions. And I think those other ambitions is something that I would like to discuss with you today. Before that, however, I want to share a note with you. As much as the fine art program assembles us, something I'm deeply, deeply, deeply appreciative of and proud that Buck can humbly contribute uh, to it. I must also admit that the terminology of socially engaged art and independent art spaces is not part of our discourse at Buck. Rather than reflecting thus today on the linkages between social engaged art and independent art spaces, I will speak from within the ongoing collective experimental processes that are currently underway at Buck, engaging with the questions about um, and practices of the art institution in the face of today's social, aesthetic, political, economic, ecological, technological, epidemiological, and psychological conjuncture at this third decade of the 21st century, devastated by um, perpetual catastrophes of racial and extractivist capitalism. Necessarily thus, um, I am not offering a wrong body of theory, but uh, merely thoughts um, that are tentative and speculative. Um, there are also thoughts and practices, and this is really something a very important and I want to say that have emerged from collaborative work, conversation and exchange, and thus in the spirit of interdependence, none of them are mine. I have inquired with a number of people uh, engaged in this project uh, about giving this talk before I agreed, and even if I did not manage to bring them to speak here with me due to organization constraints, I'm really glad that many of them have, jo uh, of them have joined uh, today, uh, hoping they will join uh, the conversation later on. Um, that said, I will um, engage a fully vocal and multi-directional choir of artists, scholars and activists directly or indirectly involved in these processes, hoping to leave behind an impromptu bibliography, if you will, activating the Buck archive of not merely academic references, but of embodied knowledges gathered through embodied research and collective learning practice. Thus, as I said, that rather than presenting this or that project, from the Bug Archive, I'd like to address the emerging pathways from art institution to community portal from within these processes by taking you with me on a path of thinking and imagining. Uh, mainly by close reading of a few extraordinary works. Um, these works, uh, as I will try to show, signal to us, to me, the changing priority, uh, priorities, urgencies, and commitments for institutional work in the face of the world today. And lastly, I agree with feminist thinker Rebecca Solnit when she claims that um, what we are left with today in the face of these conditions of the world is disillusionment, disillusionment. In its affirmative sense, however, disillusionment as literally letting go of illusions. And I would like to maintain that spirit of letting go of illusions in the art world 
uh, today. Undergirding this disillusionment, says Solnit, is, and I quote, a readiness to question foundations that have been uh, portrayed as fixed, inevitable, unquestionable. Whether that foundation was gender norms, heterosexuality, patriarchy, white supremacy, the age of fossil fuels, or capitalism. To see beyond what we had seen before, or to change the we, whose perceptions define the real, the important, and importantly, the possible. Unquote. I'd like to begin with quick introductory insights into what has been a key tenet in Buck's institution making, namely the notion of instituting otherwise. Now, perhaps to quickly think this concept, it may be best to turn to the notion of so called instituent practices conceptualized by philosopher and art theorist Gerald Rane. Building an argument about the institution of the common, Rannick sees instituent practice as actualization of the future that is, and I quote, not the opposite of institution in the way that a utopia, for, for instance, is the opposite of that reality. Institute practice as a process and concatenation of instituent events is instead an absolute concept beyond the opposite of institution. In other words, it does not oppose the institution, but it does flee institutionalization, unquote. Now, such institutional practices take place in the trans transversal overlaps between progressive art institution, radical artistic practices, and other social actors, think social movements and political activism, for example. So as to collectively prototype a future practice, if you will, in Rannick's words of, and I quote again, the production and treatment of political aesthetic problem complexities. A future practice of the production and treatment of political aesthetical, aesthetic problem complexities. This constellation does away with the us versus them split ontology, which assumes that we are the producers of the solutions that will help educate or simply share with the community or perhaps improve their physical or psychological uh, conditions of life. Now this split ontology still sees the identity of the artist constructed from a gentle blend of exceptionalism and childishness. And here I borrow the the most beautiful sentence from a writer, critic and curator, Oliver Marbouf, who talks about the sticky trope of the social identity of the artist as an irresponsible hero or heroine who does not want to see and connect to the real. A quick slide on, a uh, quick note on, on the slides, uh, note that I assume that this very well-educated community who, who uh, zoomed in into this talk, who is on this call, um, would really need to go to, to this um, uh, art terms um, a glossary. But I must say that when I was trying to figure out um, what is the realm within which I move when I talk about the relationship between social engaged practice and art institution, trying to go beyond two very kind of overwhelming positions. One is social engaged art just runs away from an art institution or from the art institution. That's one and the other position would be um, uh, a kind of cynical account of, of abuse or instrumentalization of the artist. It was very difficult to find uh, with a quick Google, Google search a more nuanced, uh, nuanced position. And thus, this was the first reference that popped up on my screen in a quick search on the relationship between social engaged art and art institutions. And while I trust this is not the reference for our research, it's beyond sad to see such blatant replication of systemic asymmetries of power in our field. Now, the process of instituting otherwise presupposes a commitment to continuous search of relational modalities of not subsumption, but solidarity and coalitionality. One may also want to remember that the institution and that the, does the art institution is always already implicated in the production of inequalities that social engagement addresses in the first place. And it's important for me to say this from the position of, of the institution, the art institution is always already implicated in the production of inequalities that social engagement addresses in the first place. On the other hand, 
uh, another important complication, the community, the way I understand it, or we understand it at work, exists as a body of relations only as long as it is maintained as decidedly distinct from this institutional um, uh, establishment. And so there is, there is a complicated double bind. And maybe because this is a training platform, um, a, a view into another another reader um, that we that we published, uh, uh, which I co-edited together with Ranjit Hoskote, uh, called "Future Publics: The Rest Can and Should Be Done by the People." A critical reader in contemporary art on precisely these matters and the ways of overcoming these blatant asymmetries. As, as philosopher and theorist Athena Atanasio has stated in her contribution to Bax 2016 former West publication, we are today faced with the theoretical and political dilemma uh, that arises as uh, follows. We need public spaces, homes, parks, schools, hospital libraries, and art institutions to sustain the possibility of living and being in common. And yet, at the same time, these institutions with all their class, racial, ethnic, and gender inflections are technologies of normalizations and disposability. As they determine and regulate livability, they also compromise or negate the sustainability of certain modes of life. Something went wrong, I think it's fine now. Okay. To praise it differently, as much as instituted precarity saturates our lives under neoliberalism, by rigidifying already existing inequalities and injustices and producing new ones, we cannot simply give up on the institutions that have been implicated in our suffering, despite precisely through their commitment to public interest. To put it bluntly, institutions sustain, sustain us and wipe us out at the same time. Against this, um, What seems to be at stake is a critical redefinition of the institution as a practical topos of long-term interpolation and disenfranchisement according to norms of race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, and at the same time as a complex constellation of traversal, uneasy interiority, and uncanny occupation. This requires that we critically question and go beyond the classical disjunctive modes that often marks the language and imagination of political contestation, namely the binarism between either working within immanent conditions or from a presumptively pure and apocalyptic outside. And this is a really important proposition that I would like to uh, carry on uh, into this talk, this notion of instituting otherwise that operates with, within, against ambivalent positionality. That is, it compels a spectral political location of both proximity and distance, which would allow us to deauthorize the institution's normalizing violence, while at the same time resisting the neoliberal market rationality that depletes non-market institutions. And as I would like to ask you, invite you to, to, to keep this, this notion of with, within, against, this three-pronged notion of these three positions that one embodies at the same time um, in relation uh, to institutions and in our conversation today. So from the uh, perspective of instituting otherwise, this relation with the with, with and against positionality proposes a radical collective, it, it is a proposition for a radical and collective renegotiation of the subject positions of a viewer, visitor, spectator, participant, ally, and constructing instead the relation through coalitionality, fellowship, co-conspiration, communion, and mutual complicity. And we'll return to this la later. Now, such a relation between community um, and um, um, institution, or such a relation, such as reworking, is predicated on an existence of community of culture practices and ways of life that opposes not the institution, but its logic of immanent institutionalization, and which thus holds the institution continuously to account and under pressure to always nearly start again. And this, this, this statement of or the need of always nearly start again is to quote Raunik one more time. Now this is not a spectacle of critique institutional or otherwise, 
but an opening up to a politics that simultaneously enacts If you just bear with us a moment. Are you still with us, Maria? If you just bear with us whilst we get the speaker back. So I seem to be moving. I seem to see myself moving on the screen. Is this a good sign? So I will always remember that sentence of Iri Drogov one day when she said, when we in the West congratulate ourselves with having an infrastructure, we are not quite having it. We see how that infrastructure determines us and binds us to protocols of either enjoying it or resisting it. So let's me to uh, let me reshare the screen. If this happens again, maybe you can have a conversation. Let's try. So how am I doing? The presentation is back on the screen now. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. I don't know where I lost you. And um, anyway, I, I wanted to say this, that this relationship with the community that, that keeps, well, keeps the institution both to account and under pressure to always nearly start again, that relationship is not a spectacle of institutional or other critique, but an opening up to politics that simultaneously enacts and resists the institution through critical imagination as practice. Now, in the, in the present, the future uh, by perpetual catastrophes of racial and extractivist capitalism, this notion of instituting otherwise it is clearly less about institution itself than about creating conditions of how to be together otherwise. The task ahead then is to envision and actualize the pathways towards another futurity. And so let me now take you to, to trainings for the not yet. Um, we in 2019 and early 2020, trainings for the not yet, which was, and I quote, an exhibition as a series of trainings for a future of being together. Otherwise, co-convened with a multitude of collaborators by artists Jennifer Heisweig and Buck. Now the project began with a seemingly innocent, simple question addressed to the artists uh, at the onset of our collaborations, indeed, how to be together otherwise. On the background of very complex conversation um, uh, within, within our team and within, within the institution around how does a public institution essentially deliver on its public mandate? So what are the stakes? Who owns public institutions? Who keeps public institutions accountable, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, going as far as thinking how could institutions such as BAC essentially be co-owned, co-shared? Um, if I was more skilled when it comes to language, I would probably find a better, better language to kind of eliminate the notion of ownership, private ownership out of this conversation. But alas, this is uh, what I'm not yet uh, uh, capable of articulating otherwise. Nonetheless, in response to this question, Jana has put into motion an immense sweeping process of invitation by means of establishing a personal connection with, she doesn't like to hear it, but hundreds of individuals, groups, communities, and movements, those engaged in struggles against the structural violence and unequal distribution of resources in today's society. To come together, to learn, to mutualize each other's competencies and rehearse um, the potentials of radical collectivity uh, and active empowerment. And perhaps the term rehearse is misnomer, to train the potential, to train in the potentials of radical collectivity and ac active empowerment. The daily trainings 
by and with the community, often self-convened, not always, over the course of a number of months, daily trainings, activated the subjects ranging from dreamscaping to radical listening, from creating sanctuary to enacting radical care, from fighting in the struggle for housing to building economies of solidarity, and from composing intersectional alliances to becoming truly collective. Yeah? And here I'm getting into that kind of reshuffling of the urgencies and commitments um, that might take a number of institutions around us uh, by surprise. Now the trainings activated a form of culture involvement at a, let's say threshold of visibility. Unfolding practices of not yet comprehensibly, uh, comprehensible and not yet captured as object or language. And uh, here I want to make a very important comment about the images because I am going to show you images from that particular, uh, particular set of trainings. But what you can see, and uh, we in the art world obsessively photograph um, everything that happens. We obsessively record everything what happens without really realizing that precisely what happens in such a training is impossible to see. It's invisible in that respect. If I mentioned this about the threshold of, threshold of uh, visibility, one could uh, visit trainings for the not yet as an exhibition in its own right, albeit always in motion and continuously changing. For the training grounds, the exhibition as a training ground was populated with not so much the objects of art, but what with, uh, with what the genre terms learning objects. And here's quite an important shift that I would want us to uh, 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 not forget, uh, specifically when it comes to social engaged uh, art practices, commitment to learning. Now, <clears throat> this learning object includes some of the pivotal engagements of Jeanne throughout her work over the last 20 plus years. Um, uh, like we can hear, we can see uh, here, for example, but also um, they are joined by a number of learning objects from other artists. Before I get there, a few images from the trainings, as I said, and I really, really beg you to look at these images with understanding that precisely what that which is happening there is impossible to see, is impossible to archive, is impossible to touch. It is not even possible to describe with the language we have at our disposal because what's happening is embodied research, is embodied, it's production of embodied, uh, embodied knowledge, it's a production of knowledge and learnings otherwise. Nonetheless, I, I'll take the risk. To see here, for example, how really the learning objects get animated um, uh, through trainings until you get a professional photographer to photograph the object this way. So um, uh, this, this is one of very important uh, works by Jennifer van Heisberg, but also there were other learning objects by other artists whom she invited. This is, for example, Ultra Red or Patricia Carsonhout, uh, other artists whom she invited because they, they share this practice of of art being geared towards modeling of modeling the world via both artistic imagination and via enacting alternatives to the present world through social action. Now, refusing the notion of authorship, ownership, and spectatorship, here we go, in her own work, Jana does not see her role as other than co-initiator or co-convener. Um, uh, of collective uh, learning processes, she considered these as political aesthetic repositories, political aesthetic repositories uh, of knowledges, of learnings, waiting actually for activation if and when needed. In Jana's words, they are, and I quote, tools for trainings for the not yet, for rehearsing ways to materialize and imagine worlds, uh, and for practicing art as and of collective solidarity and mutual care. Unquote. So shifting the emphasis from emergency, the way I started, emergency of the world to emergence, Jeanne trusts that the not yet, the not yet imagined, uh, the not yet articulated and the not yet named contours of another world and another futurity emerge out of the weaving relations, out of an assembly of people, communities, 
but also ideas, objects, rehearsals, art, shared food, research talks, politics, performances, screenings, teachings and learnings, etc. when they involve deliberately practicing training together. This was a multi-directional exchange of push and pull, full of conflict, incoherence, um, uh, often misunderstanding, but mostly care for one, one another. What it caused uh, in these overlapping interests and processes that it entailed was that it profoundly shifted the hierarchies, power relations, archives of knowledge that have been activated, and priorities within, within its institutional hosting site. An instance of de and reinstituting in another modality, if you will. So this is when you're being held to account and pressure to always start again anew. Now, it seems to me that by, as Jeanne and, and, and contributors to this, to this training would claim that pre and, uh, by pre-enacting another world and another future, we within and against the institution, uh, the institution of Buck, trainings for the not yet concurrently pre-enacting, pre-enacted Buck as another institution or another kind of institution, of course, or at the very least, they sowed a new emerging form within it. This is quite important. There are, there are thinkers who say we don't need institutions. We need emerging forms today emerging form within it, evolving through social improvisation in constant motion, incomplete and fugitive, organized and self-organized and always collective. Was pre-configured, if you will, as an intervening space-time. It was separate from the normal order of things on one side, and on the other, it was a gateway into an elsewhere and an elsewhen, a community portal. Now we know that in sci-fi and in visionary fiction, the portal serves as a pathway between one world and the next and between this and that temporality. But importantly for me, the portal also marks the gateway into a place where the rules that have been guiding the narrative, as we know it, are about to radically change. And I want to now take a closer look at what changing of rules this potential art institution as community portal points towards. I want to specifically look at the notions of the not yet, anticipatory learning, dispersed institution, and the notions of being complicit with, of accomplices. And I'll discuss each of them through a concrete learning project from the trainings. From now on, I will very consciously withdraw uh, any photography or images from the trainings and I, I will really focus on learning of start from the notion of the not yet and this particular installation by black quantum futurism all time is local from 2019 because what I want to look at is how temporality um, that we need to pay attention to is changing radically at this very moment. Now, first, big, uh, Black Quantum Futurism is a multidisciplinary collaboration between poet, musician, and activist Kamai Ayewa and artist, author, and activist Rashida Phillips. With a Black Futurist appro approach to times and time and space, they explore the intersections of imagination, fiction, creative media, DIY aesthetics and activism in marginalized communities, focusing on recuperation and preservation of communal memories, histories, and stories. Now, this, this installation of all time is local, seeks to disrupt the conventions of linear time that reign normatively over every day and our institutional practices and our artistic practices. Building up on the legacy of the civil rights and Black liberation movements, as well as Black futures, philosophy, and aesthetics. Its content contemplates multiple unexplored histories, nows and futures, multiple. It celebrates the transformative power of Afro diasporan philosophy and liberation technologies, such as time travel, um, that can unlock ancestral memories, just as it can retrieve, as uh, Ayeva says, memories from realities that haven't happened yet. 
Here, the intersection of futures, mind, a mindset, quantum physics, and black culture traditions of consciousness, time, and space, there emerges a not yet, a vista into the impending futures, and the renewed capability to choose and actively create path and trajectories to reach them. The training around this learning object titled Community Futurism Announced Neighborhood Walks, Freestyle Poetry and awaken, uh, uh, to Awaken Past and Future Memories of a Particular Location, South Scales, Building a Toolbox to Help reserve, uh, a Reverse Gentrification, Interactive Lectures and Building Quantum Event Maps and Quantum Time Capsules with the Community. The tools, in other words, in order to move us out of our temporal ghettos that the universal modern master clock, a master clock uh, locks us into uh, as it unevenly distributes spatial temporal mobility agency and determination. What do we learn from this learning object? Clearly the not yet is a temporal category or also a temporal category, but it is not simply a future projection towards its chronopolitics that I believe need to guide our work in art institutions today. Now, we know under the modern regime, the future based on the unsustainable myth of energy expansion and growth, etc., and appearing in a linear fashion from past, present into the future is essentially an extension and expansion of the now, rendering in effect temporal distinction between past, present and future futile. They don't really matter, right? Because this hegemonic futurity is synonymous with the neoliberal machine of destruction producing class of the defuture. Just the expansion or more of the now, extension and expansion of the now that is produ producing a class of the defuture. It's possible that the future is, the future is, uh, uh, is what needs to guide our considerations. How do we work with our communities, with what we likely the audience as to livable time? Livable time, as philosopher Marina Gash says, I was freezing probably for a while. I apologize. Am I back? There you go. Um, you in now. the sense of philosopher, I'm back. Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, no access to livable time in the sense of philosopher Marina Garces, um, who's, who articulated the notion of livable time as the time in which one can still intervene and shape the conditions of life. So in this never ceasing now, one is forced to continuously answer and resist each new catastrophe of the disastrous interlocking crisis, ending up in complete exhaustion. The not yet, however, even if temporarily, contests this pre-ordered urgencies and unhinges time from the master's block. This is a labor, of course, of decolonizing time, shifting resistance to re-existence. This term I'm bor borrowing from decolonial scholar Rolando Vasquez, and thus shifting to the chronopolitics of proposition, prefiguration, and pre-enactment. The not yet is not guided by utopia. And this is really important. Remember moving, uh, moving forward without illusions. And I think art is, has been complicit in this kind of illusions uh, um, uh, we got caught into. Stronger yet, it rejects utopian thinking that outsources the possibility of livable life to an island, enclave, colony, or other world spaces These are, that are populated by the new man, new subject, the better than human humans. A new society with no account of history and thus, thus with no need to recognize its colonialisms, historic uh, and contemporary, in the continued violent separations along the line of race, gender, economic culture, etc. Instead, I wonder could one think of the not yet as chronotopian? And I'm activating here once again uh, the back archive with a reference to a talk by writer and critic Omadi Cheng just three weeks ago. Now, departing from Michael Bakhtin's chronotope, uh, of course, a concept that in, uh, indicates how configuration of, of time and space impact the use of language and discourse, chronotopia is the merging, as it were, of time and praxis, or better yet, and this is something I want to take with us into the community 
portal. It merges time plus space plus agency, a composition of forces animated by the understanding that we begin where we are, without the fantasy of a clean slate or an absolute break, but with the vision of possibility of restoring the notion of social, cultural, and ecological justice into life, as well as into the epistemological and aesthetic practices when cultivating social change. At stake is in Ocean's words, and I quote, the radical politics of ungovernability, which involves practicing a radical, comprehensive, nuanced, and multidimensional imagination about what ultimately makes for a good society. I want to move to my second learning object and speak about anticipatory learning. It is a study manifesto 5.0 from 2018, written, uh, written collaboratively by artists Joy Mariama Smith and Rauni Saleh. And uh, 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 even if I'm risking uh, to run out of time, I really want to um, read it out for us. To all those mad about studying, do what you're doing, keep doing it, observe the importance of what happens while doing. What are you doing? What is happening? Practice of anti-productivity. Refuse to be doing things all the time. Shift all of your attention to the thing that starts to appear. What is at play here? I, we refuse to be doing things all the time. Acknowledge the complex interrelationship between a text and other texts. Notice the complex web of meaning making, of becoming and unbecoming. Our own meaning is not defined on its own. Read in between the lines. Come and play with this text. Allow yourself to become alien. Become alien. Resist the binary. This text is to be taken. This text is to be taken. Decentralize knowledge production. Decentralize intellectual activity. Decentralize what you think study looks like. Notice the strange cracks, holes, and layers where intellectual, uh, intellectuality is happening. Become obsessed with otherly figures who are also studying decentralized knowledge production, decentralized knowledge production, decentralized knowledge production, take turns in teaching and learning, become possessed by beings other than human, do not in isolation, do not in isolation, engage with others, don't isolate a thing, listen to what's happening between bodies, don't isolate a thing, decentralize intellectual activity, decentralize knowledge production, no alienation, no isolation, no marginalization, no individualization, no marginalization, no isolation. Text is a space, transparency, access, availability, accountability. Joy and pleasure is the mark of learning. The joy of intellectual work must be revealed. Don't alienate as a means of learning. Intellectual work requires sociality and movement. Joy and pleasure reaches deep and lets the learning sink wide within. Think about how joyful learning feels for you. Think about how joyful learning feels for you. We have something. We already have something worth keeping. We have something and we want to keep it. We aren't have less. We have something of importance. Study is already emergent and it is not white. Study is not white, study is needed. Together our affected uh, bodies studies. Avoid foolish hate for opposition. Don't oppose for the sake of opposition only. Communicate differences in understanding without shame. Resist white supremacy and respect. Welcome and encourage a healthy difference in understanding. Learn more, learn and read beyond what is written. Social engaged artistic practices and art institutions um, uh, committed to this sort of practices today are committed to learning at the same time. But the main uh, main reference here uh, is perhaps um, um, inspired or a set of references. Sorry, I'm trying to cut through my text now. Uh, main references are inspired by Black fugitive femi feminism and gender studies. And, and of course, as you probably sense from the text, departing from Stefano Harnes and Fred Moten's uh, The under, under Commons. The training around this in this learning object sought an understanding of study as unrestricted sociality. And I think this is given we are, tr we are a training platform, we need to take these shifts. In, in, the, in, in learning into serious, serious uh, consideration. Unrestricted sociality, one that dissolves the overwhelming centrality of formal education, escapes fixed uh, strictures, policies and identity, and engages formally unrecognized knowledges, unrecognized archives of knowledge and desires. 
Now, if the not yet is a chrono chronotopia aimed at decolonizing uh, time and the future, one could think of, of this learning, uh, the trainings for the not yet committed to as decolonial learning. Guided by relationality, learning here is a collective practice of thinking, imagining, and doing with other, which opens up and connects to multiple archives of knowledge, including those suppressed under the colonial modern. It engages in the task of deep listening as a practice of learning each other, testing out interdependencies, and holding space for one another. Instantiated as relational pedagogies in and of the not yet, this is in fact anticipatory learning. And this notion of anticipatory learning means a coming together of community to learn what does not yet exist. The yet unnameable, not yet named, invisible, not yet seen, inaudible, not yet heard, unarchivable, ungovernable, spectral perhaps, warding of contemporary capture. And these are the words of Iridrogov and, and uh, others. Uh, from a free, free thought curatorial collective with whom we currently work on a, rise, a research itinerary on spectral infrastructure. With this open outcome of this sort of anticipatory learning, for there's no determinant event to rehearse, there's no concrete problem to resolve, no particular community to help, Instead, anticipatory learning is learning a new world and each other by indirection, as extraordinary political theorists and activists Stuart Hall once named it. Let me go into my last um, uh, learning object uh, for today. And I have to confess that due to shorter time, uh, having lost my connection a couple of times, I'm going to try to merge two arguments here through the work radicalizing the local from 2008 and ongoing by Jeanne herself. And so of course, what you see is a diagram um, um, on free house radicalizing the local. The, the diagram is a learning object. So it's not something uh, that we should be looking at. This is something we should study and study with. It grew from a collaborative project in Rotterdam, uh, initiated by Bajan in the late 1990s, actually, uh, a space where local inhabitants from shopkeepers to youngsters to artists to designers and so on meet to exchange knowledge, experience, and ideas, as well as to engage in mutually beneficial culture economic co productions. From 2008 onward, applying its approach to Afrikaanderwijk, um, uh, a neighborhood uh, in uh, south of Rotterdam. Uh, Freehouse has sought uh, neighborhood empowerment through community participation, culture and economic self-organization, and inclusive urban development. Radical, uh, radicalizing the local shows the process of building the collaborative political economy by bringing together informal culture and economic practices of the everyday into stronger networks and urban unions, evolving into new organizational form on the scale of a neighborhood. And this solidarity-driven initiative still operates today in the form of a co-op, albeit not without gigantic challenges, but still as a really crucial evidence that models of being together otherwise are possible in spite of today's political economic reality, which presents itself as one without alternatives. Now, hugely still with us, Maria. I think you just froze there for a moment. If you just bear with us whilst the um the speaker just reconnects back, thank you. I seem to be back. Okay, great. Is that the case? Thank you. Yay. Okay. So in parallel to this work, during the trainings, a parallel discussion ensued about the notion of local. Because Jana continuously talked about, um, you know, local, 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 and, and uh, inviting people from across the world. Um, Jana has readily offered her definition of the local as something that has little to do with confined neighborhoods or shared postal co code. Rather, the local is an emotional and ideological infrastructure. Emotional and ideological infrastructure 
that which holds us together in affective modality, if you will, and which replicates across topologies of different, different um, uh, sorts, across geography, stance, practices, movements, and, and disciplines. This force, this prompted uh, back to actually undertake new set of moves, of course, um, accelerated uh, due to the age of pandemics when, when we need to rework the relationship between local and global, which is anyway a policy of, of the past couple of decades, uh, I, I believe, and try to think the notion of the otherwise and elsewhere together. Um, I will truncate that, that argument, but I try to propose that on the basis of this nodal expression of locality, so that the local as emotional ideological infrastructure uh, repeats itself across the planet, essentially, allows you to talk the inter interconnection to elsewhere in, in a new way. This is uh, something that, that, that intensely influenced the process of instituting it, but, or should I maybe say executing, building, um, uh, building from the term execution by philosopher Michel Serre. For the relationality and nodality cultivated in the shift from art institution to community portal also means advancing towards an institution model that disperses, not merely internally, but becoming a sort of centrifugal, eccentric coalition of a personalized heterogeneous and concrete connections with elsewhere, articulating as a multi-sided grid of linkages with people, localities, and itineraries. It produces a dispersed institution that breaks from the traditional means of time, space, homogeneity. And uh, as of um, uh, September, we're setting up a fellowship program in such a way that we disperse it rather than concentrate it. Uh, uh, at back, we decenter, off-center the institution, also in physical terms, by dispersing, not by means of branding, but dispersing material, any material conditions for working, um, for artists uh, working in completely different um, uh, uh, geographical locales, but locality that are ours. And a very fast, a last argument about accomplices. This brings me to Basic Activist Kitchen, which um, was a community um, um, that organized during the trainings for the not yet daily cooking sessions and meals for participants and for pastors by Different individuals and collectives joined, joined daily in collaboration, engaged um, in, uh, um, in cooking essentially, uh, and using this occasion for a conversation, not only about cooking, but what uh, being cooking together, eating together actually means uh, for community and, and uh, coalition, uh, coalitionality. The basic activist kitchen. Now those careful listeners among you, that is if you're still with me and that would presuppose I am still with you digitally connected, may have already realized or, or heard noticed that the basic activist kitchen would abbreviate as the buck. In hindsight, I now see how the seemingly simple act of co-opting Buck by the basic activist kitchen, by adding this modifying determiner to Buck's institutional name, has seeded the future community portal nested with, within and against Buck. And indeed, the number of people from within this group of activists, artists, researchers uh, in, with backgrounds in theater, art, squatting, organizing, anthropology, history, and gender studies, among others, joined Buck consequently as research fellows, and stayed with Buck after the completion of the fellowship as Buck accomplices. Not allies, but accomplices, a neither easy nor sleek alignment, but a more meaningful commitment to one another in the pursuits of the not yet. Now, as we speak, the accomplices pursue various itineraries. I hope I am back with you. You are, yes, you just froze for a moment there. As we speak, as I try to speak, their accomplices pursue various itineraries to develop the features of the community portal from different perspectives. Archival infrastructure as political learning, fermentation, affective infrastructure, and various other interactive protocols of coexistence. Those protocols cannot come from the institution. Those protocols can only come from within the community portal itself. As Shana has commented, commented, and I quote, it is a true emergence of an organ 
that created its own function within the body of the institution. It becomes an organism within another organism, unquote. Existing inside the institution, right? Nested within it, rather than a relationship of co-dependency, it is one of co-interaction with a focus of mutual being on mutual, mutual benefit, decentralization, practice, cooperation, local determination, and self-organization. Now, to describe the guidelines or protocols for creating such a, such a space and its maintenance, Grace Lostia, one of the uh, accomplices at BAC, often refers to the concept of nuclear anarchy, nuclear anarchy, as inspired by uh, biologist Amy Gladfelter's research into filamentous fungi. To quote Grace, nuclear anarchy refers to a process of traffic flow in which the participants and the network infrastructure constantly responds to stimuli, 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 possibilities, and learning in reciprocity. The stimuli responses lead to a change of direction to which the whole network will respond toward appealing prospects and away from unappealing ones. So, um, uh, intuitive relationality in, rela in, in, in direction and in speed of mutual nourishment. I continue with the quote. Participants and collectives can act in reciprocity at their own pace, but the infrastructure itself is always open to respond to the different needs, urgencies, and stimuli in an organic way. Unpredictability can be accepted as long as it's aiming at a common goal rather than a failure, allowing these different speed-based needs, formats, and protocols to work together without eventually getting into catastrophic conflicts. Unquote. Referring back to the notion of radicalizing the local, once again, this time to the etymology of the radical as what is at the root, this multi-directional process of the fungal, fungal roots that in Grace's words, nourishes and is nourishing reciprocity is what's at stake in co-interaction when the portal opens new pathways to multiple other archives of knowledge, to the practices of decolonial listening, mutual care, of organizing and becoming collective and a type of critique that unfolds in relation to others and through different ways of ruling the world. And in closing, the commitment to not yet, um, the notion of anticipatory learning, the dispersed and radical local seem to offer remarkably important guidance in seeking ways with others to reclaim a livable life, to reclaim livable life through changing the coordinates of time, space, plus agency, with, within, against the institution, so as to attempt the infinitely improbable break with the way of the world today, and then imagine it anew and let this fiction join the world to become the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for such a complex and temporally interwoven talk as well. Um, we now have time for questions or comments. As you mentioned, there are a few people in the audience that you've worked with, so very much opening up the floor. If anyone has any comments, questions, remarks, you can either put it into the chat or you can simply raise your hand, which is down in the reactions section on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Claude, please go ahead. Hi. Um, I don't know something that I realize I haven't actually think about in my and idea that an institution is, and I found it very about all as another temple that underlies what not yet we can access, and then it becomes uh, a port. Then the portal becomes uh, a portal between two different, always already. I think you've just frozen a bit there, Claude. You might have to just repeat question the question. Becomes, yeah, yeah. I, 
I'm coming to a question, so maybe it's better if I just continue. Uh, the question is, or the question becomes, how can art institutions harbor spaces that are safe from the linear developmental temporality of neoliberal capitalism? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, this, 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 is this very simple question for me? <laughs> it's more, it's actually mostly my research, so uh, no, but... Uh... <laughs> so, um, of course, there are a number of people who involved uh, involved in these processes and could probably uh, speak to this um, uh, much better than I can. But the, the for me, the question was... was the development of the community portal that I can only observe from a, from position of you know being directed in the institution. My question is whether one could in, uh, imagine uh, an art institution as a site of emancipation to such an ex ex uh, extent that actually one could desert from the limitations or unfreedoms of the everyday into the institution. It's very counterintuitive and majority of people with whom, with whom we work today will disagree because we have very different uh, experiences with the institution. The question about deserting is not the running away or fleeing away from, from somewhere, but it's a, it's a way, of, way of world making. So deserting from the framework that the neoliberal uh, uh, constellation imposes upon you. And I, uh, when I quoted Eric Rogov, I, uh, Rogov, I talk about this critical imperative of the now, as she says it. So in, within that critical imperative of the now, the urgency has, urgencies are pre-ordered for us. So we just go and try to try to respond to everything, meaning we can respond to nothing. The question is whether in, in, uh, art institutions could ris disrupt this categorical imperative of now to temporarily step into the into another temporality, and then, of course, return to your everyday life, right? I'm not, I'm not naive uh, uh, in that way that you crossed another, another road through the art institution. But the question is, what is it that you carry with you from the training when you step back? And I tend to talk about residue. Others, uh, others oppose the term because residue has slightly kind of negative, ne negative connotation. Um, one of our accomplices um, is thinking precisely about this by when I leave Buck after this enormous experience, which I cannot describe because I only feel that something extraordinary happened. Like when you go like, what has just happened? You cannot name it, you cannot put it with names, but you carry it within your uh, affective um, uh, emotional makeup back into the normal of the, of the world. And that's the, the, the question for me is, can art institution in this relation with, within and against actually disrupt the neoliberal uh, linear uh, time and neo neoliberal temporality, uh, uh, even if temporarily, but often enough so that the residue carried back can actually function as that kind of uh, feeding nourishing system that that I quoted of uh, of grace of uh, fungi underground oh, the nourishment system uh, uh, that I talked about and I know in previous conversations the question was what is the relationship between this sort of developments micro political aesthetic experimentation and let's say revolution and um, uh, Grace would be very clear about it, uh, you know, thinking about the moment when the mushroom pops is, um, uh, is actually a result of years, decades, hundreds of years of organizing, connecting and, and community nourishing. So that's, that's where the, where the uh, link uh, uh, actually, actually resides. So this, this question that needs to be tested, I don't know whether one can desert into the art institution, whether that could be a, a potentially a move to, to explore. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to think about the art institution as a space of collapse of multiple temporalities in relation to the 
hegemonic temporality of neoliberal capitalism. Yeah. And yes. thank you, Claude, because because a, a community, our accomplices working working on the on the portal, to my knowledge, very very often talk about collapse. Uh, um, but in a in a, um, a positive again, kind of affirmative sense. Uh, specifically, specifically collapse of those kind of three, three realms that we at Bug operate. Uh, you know, I would say we operate in the inter intersections or convergences between art, theory, and knowledge production and social action. And even if I want to claim that we always work at the intersection, of course, those are separate realms, and they're separate realms mainly because of the languages that are impossible. Uh, to, to, to easily negotiate. So Jeanne, for example, always says, you know, the, the, the community portal happens at the moment when the distinction between these categories, if you will, collapse into one. The other conversation around collapse is about how the power relations are uh, a position uh, 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 partitioned within the organization. And of course, I'm a director of this institution. So when I say like, oh, come to my institution, it's a portal you can desert into. I'm of course fooling myself. And that's why I keep stressing that I'm, I'm really aware of how, how um, art institutions are actually, actually complicit in the suffering, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, I, that I've been talking about. But then the, the notion of power within this, this uh, institutions in relation or, uh, to community for a portal is very interesting to look at. Um, uh, I would never claim Bug is a horizontally organized uh, uh, institution. It is not, I'm the director of the institution, not only, not, perhaps mostly because of, uh, there are certain moments where horizontality is essentially dangerous. Um, so at some point, uh, at some at some situations, some some conditions, it's important that there is somebody who can take responsibility um, uh, in such a way that it would ward off the dangers to others. Um, but um, I think what what's happening at Bach and and we're thinking about it a, a lot, and um, it's that that it's interesting to maintain both vertical and horizontal axis of power always active and, and uh, uh, depending on circumstances, you can activate the link, the relationship between those axes is differently. Um, again, I might be fooling myself and say, I know precisely with, uh, which axis of power needs to be engaged. Um, um, so so this, is, this is extremely, extraordinarily problematic. Uh, a conversation, but one that needs to be had about where the power is positioned. But I think what's happening uh, 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 in relationship with community portal, it feels as if inside the so-called public institution, there was su suddenly some process ongoing of self-instituting of the institution of the common. We always think that there is public institutions, there are institutions of the common, the question again, if we overcome these differences of, uh, you know, that binaries force us into, whether this is a possible relationship that is appearing there. And I find that extraordinary promising, promising uh, option, but one would need to understand how to maintain those hierarchies of power in such a way, of this, those axes of power in such a way that it does not become uh, a material for cooptation by, uh, by the, uh, uh, public institution called Bach. And I'm grateful, Claude, for this uh, question because we have had tons of conversations with uh, a number of ESRs uh, who, who come to, to join us at Bach for uh, quite some months in the meantime, and I uh, found that very uh, inspiring. So thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. Fabiola? You have a question? Yes. Hi, Maria. Thank you very much for this inspiring Hi, talk. Um, I would also ask you something in regards to this idea of community portal. And I was wondering how to make this very networked and disruptive way that Bach wants to work, like this methodology, with the often more centralizing and rigid 
um, procedure and standards that are required when being a public institution or generally public uh, funding. And also, since you talked about the effective and ideological communities that you are working with, I'm also wondering how to create connection and bond when you actually have to deal uh, with these affected groups. So groups that are very far from like um, a theoretical and political perspective, let's say. Thank you, Fabiola. I don't know whether it was me this time or your connection froze. Um, so I might have only gotten part of the, of the first question, but it concerned funding, I think. Yeah, it concerned the, the ways in which to bring together such an experimental and disruptive methodology as the one that Bach uh, carries on with the procedure and standards required uh, by funding, like the rules that usually institutions need to comply to, basically. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Um, it's, it's apparent that I believe in institutions um, because I, I believe um, uh, one needs both flexibility and robustness in order to, to, um, to create, create a space of possibility vis-a-vis -vis the, the neoliberal capture uh, in a way. Um, Buck is, uh, of course, operating in Global North, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, it enjoys uh, um, uh, uh, good funding possibilities. Uh, so we by no means alternative or independent. That would need to be kind of looked at what is, what is independent art space, by the way, that, that just jumps into my, into my head now, because we're all interdependent to a great extent. But um, it's, it's essentially a policy, how do you ensure um, a certain level of robustness of the institution so that flexible experimentation can take, uh, can take uh, within it. Um, in the Netherlands, there's, there is quite a support for, uh, for practices that are politically and socially, uh, socially engaged in that, uh, in that respect. But it's always about um, what kind of what kind of archive of knowledge you engage when you're articulating uh, what is it precisely what you what you're doing in the in the institution. And this idea of multi, uh, engaging continuously multi, multiplicity of archives is is probably very important in in, in figuring out flexibility as to what part of uh, your practice is possible uh, with which support. We are uh, uh, dependent on public support and it's not the, it's not the, uh, it, it, it is actually the matter of choice, right? There's been for a very long time uh, a narrative that uh, if you uh, rely and depend on public support, you, you're failing as an organization. For us, it's been always a question of policy saying we're working in the public interest and connecting to audiences. And this connects to your second question. We connect to the public. We don't use the, the notion of audience. Um, uh, we, we speak about publics in, a, in a, a plural and accomplices in, in that respect. Now, there is a challenge in, um, in how do you operate multiple uh, uh, archives of knowledge at the same time. And you refer to that, there's archive of knowledge of uh, theory of Western academia. There's an archive of knowledge of embodied knowledges uh, from uh, other types of uh, experiences. And indeed, I think this negotiation is the largest challenge there essentially is. I do believe that um, um, uh, multiple archives connect through shared urgencies, right? So, um, and probably I will not, we, we rigorously record all these conversations, so I probably will not go into, into details and, uh, and concrete uh, examples. But to address this question, it was actually Jeanne um, who, who brought up um, 
uh, a serious challenge to how the, in, the, the team is constellated. And she said, you're missing one key person on your team or multiple persons on your team who actually would be community editors, who actually would be people to negotiate language um, uh, amongst uh, uh, various archives of knowledge. And now when I say language, it's not necessarily just words. And you see, I suffer to name, uh, uh, to, to suffer or struggle to name, uh, to name certain practices. And I'm always, because they don't have a name and, uh, um, uh, and happily so, you know, because they, they are quite consciously escaping that capture by language or by theory uh, in that respect. So this is dilemma, a dilemma that within the, the research network like here, we, we should, be, uh, should be somehow negotiated. But I'm always warned by a beautiful uh, sentence by um, Elizabeth Povinelli, uh, who always says like, uh, we need to be aware that when we get, uh, um, I, I paraphrase of course, that when we, uh, e when we too easily operate the language of Western modernity or liberal languages, we may not notice how quickly, delicately and dramatically at the same time, um, um, they fail to see the radical worlds. Yeah, so the moment you, you impose existing language of the, on these kind of practices, um, you might precisely miss that which is uh, which is at the core of this sort of uh, this sort of practice, and I I will never deny this is one of the largest challenges to um, academic program like these um, because we you know we need to footnote everything properly we need to uh, write texts um, and there are there are certain practices that per definition must be escaping it specifically given the, 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 uh, the contemporary culture, right? And I refer to fugitivity and, and fleeing institu institutionalization. So it also flees into institutionalization via language. And uh, here we go, that's the challenge I do not have an answer to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two questions and 10 minutes. Um, so Maria, as with your presentation, or three questions in 10 minutes, um, those asking questions, I ask you to keep it brief. Um, perhaps we can spill over into a separate conversation afterwards. And Maria, also for you to be mindful, we now have four questions in 10 minutes. Uh, that works out approximately at about three minutes per question. Karen, you're first. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I um, do it very briefly. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, how you work with change management. When you're uh, talking about uh, disruptive changes in, the, um, in your institution, how do you deal with that, especially with your team? Um, they might not always be uh, happy with changes. Um, so that would be my question. Thank you. Shall we, chain, uh, shall we take uh, all four questions and, and, uh, and then I try to jump to those or how to do this in four minutes, uh, remaining of time? That sounds good because perhaps you can wrap the questions up into themes. So from Karen, we have a question about change management. Jenny? Yes, um, I make it quick also. Um, listening to your description of um, the like undescribable nature of the experience that people make within these collective learning processes that that you describe as a portal into something new and different like I was wondering how do you work within the institution with these kind of experiences and their kind of fleeting nature how do they inform the the, the further development of the institution and your work Great, thank you, Jenny. So Jenny has a question about how does the fleeting inform the institution, so to say. Uh, Alexei, um, what is your question? Uh, uh, I just wanted, uh, uh, also being one of those 
whom uh, Maria mentioned, uh, who with whom Maria worked in different times because I participated in a few uh, meetings of former West. It was incredible. It was still recently, I think it was only um, completed and archived. Uh, so I wanted just to say how important was this sort of portal, uh, because also I, I thought about portal in conjunction with uh, a quite uh, well-known article by Arundhati Roy, who wrote during the pandemics that the pandemics is a kind of portal. And I saw the word portal also ha having to do something with a little bit with sci-fi and this sort of utopian imagination. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, how to say, to ask the question, do you, by mentioning these sort of spectral infrastructures in your uh, last concluding points, do you mean that this portal should be like uh, as invisible as possible? So it should be like reduced to be sort of spectral uh, kind of uh, basis for uh, sacrificing itself in, for this sort of transition from uh, one <laughs> our horrible, <laughs> currently very depressing neoliberal <laughs> A world into something else. So it means spectral doesn't mean that it should be like almost invisible institution or in this sense uh, something. So I will I will be short. So it's it's the end. I, I wanted to say something more, but I think it's enough uh, to. Uh, I don't know if you heard me well, uh, given all these inter interruptions. Hello. Yeah. I uh, I could hear a last part of your of your question, and of course, uh, maybe I take it from there. Um, Arundhati's Roy um, um, discussion on of pandemics as a portal is of course important. Although this conversation started much earlier, I mean, this was a project 2019-2020, but the Arundhati's Roy's um, uh, notion of portal really called the the global imagination, and there are so there's so many so there there is so much reflection um, uh, around this uh, around uh, um, uh, the question of the portal. Um, the notion of spectral infrastructure. There are a couple of people from a free thought collective here. Maybe will will be joining into into next um, uh, next kind of internal conversation by them. Um, uh, they are looking. Uh, they are indeed looking at the notion of spectral infrastructure, uh, and it would be terrible if I try to truncate the the complex research trajectory in in few seconds. But the, we we just carried a, a series of seminars with the Vera Lee Center for Art and Politics, and they are all online and and fascinating conversation around the question of visibility and inv and invisibility. Um, uh, at back we we uh, we don't embrace this notion of hyper visibility uh, in a way on which uh, the art world uh, operates and a lot of these activities specifically if you think about safe space uh, care mutual care etc cetera, etc cetera, they do rely on certain level level of invisibility but as an art institution you need to op operate variety of scales of visibilities and invisibilities at the same time yeah, so uh, I don't know, uh, Alexei, we were connected a couple of times through various projects like Former West, for example, that operated on a hyper visibility within the art world, but that also allowed uh, to create other, other sort of nested possibilities within it. And this is also what I mean about uh, when, what I mean when I talk about operating a number of um, knowledge archives uh, and realms within which you move at the same time. So uh, again, the, the choice is not binary visibility, yes or no, it's operating a spectrum of visibilities and visibil invisibilities at the same time, according to, to essentially the, the, the type and needs of whatever is, uh, whatever is happening. I mean, you have lots of Western muse museums who would claim you know, visibility and being a safe space at the same time. Uh, it's not possible. So, so here, some sort of, you know, nuancing is really is really necessary. I heard Karen's question in the beginning um, about the flexibility of the team. Um, 
I don't know whether we think about uh, uh, about the notions uh, notions of uh, flexibility in these respects. Um, I kind of feel that there is some sort of shared mission within the team with uh, uh, that is shared with the with the community. Although this idea of sharing within the community is really complicated, I would perhaps rather think in the terms of commitment. Thinking of commitments, uh, thinking of communi community as those who are committed to one another, the notion of truth and the notion of justice uh, uh, in that respect. So it is bringing the notion of justice to institutional practice, uh, uh, oxymoron as it sounds, but to aesthetic and uh, epistemological practices uh, as well. So this is this is a driving driving force. And I think it pertains across, across the, the entire team. And it's not that you at some point depose somebody from one position into another because suddenly we need a community editor. I think it is rather, uh, rather looking how in the sharing within the team can we deliver competencies or build competencies that are needed for, for, that, particular, for that particular moment. Um, truncated answer, I know, and there are two minutes and Jenny, your question I haven't heard and it's really my internet provider to blame. Should I repeat? Do we have the time? Okay, um, so you described the, um, the experiences that, uh, that ha are happening within this collective learning as uh, the, the training of the not yet that serve as this kind of the experience while going through the portal, so to speak, that they are like kind of undescribable, that they are, um, that you take pictures of them, but you can't really see what's happening there. So people only have these embodied knowledges of that. And I was wondering how you as an institution or you within the institution work with these experiences um, to kind of further develop the institution or to how, how they inform your practice. Yeah, I talk about uh, spectral and, and, and invisible and uh, what escapes capture, capture and, uh, and in, each, uh, in uh, which way. It would be unfair to say that uh, none of it is graspable in a way. And that has to do with very, very fact that if, even if you cannot grasp things through, through words, you can grasp things through other embodied senses. And that feeling, and, and uh, you join public studies uh, at Buck, and I always make this gesture like, oh, what has just happened when you share that feeling? So perhaps you cannot describe in words what happened, but you know what happened, your body knows. Um, if we do operate uh, within the field of imagination as practice, which is theoretically informed and politically driven, I think we need to find opening for this sort of experiences, even if they escape kind of capture in uh, uh, capture through uh, through language. Um, the question would be uh, would be on which level you know um, uh, one would want to answer answer this um, this question. It happens to be that we are finalizing a quite remarkable publication together with uh, Jonathan Heisweg and. Um, uh, Rachel Rakes, uh, co-edited by, by three of us uh, around these practices. And then you see that there, are, um, uh, that there are certain practices that you simply cannot put in the, in the theoretical, you know, well-researched essay, but there are other, other ways to communicate through books, whether it's storytelling, uh, drawing, uh, or poetry uh, in, that, in that respect. And I think there is a lot that one can do um, not to, in a banal way, dismiss academic uh, work, not at all. This is not at all meant that way. And, and Buck would be the first institution that would, um, you know, not want to uh, uh, dismiss the engagement in, in uh, uh, academic practices with um, people like yourselves, for example. But it's uh, where and how do you find, so it's not the one or the other, it's about, how you always really carefully try to find find a form, and in this respect, um, I, I've been really fascinating lately about the uh, by uh, with the um, around the revival, if you will, or maybe it's just my rediscovery of poetry 
um, amongst young generation. And I find it one of the most fascinating uh, developments that I see poetry as a way to disable language as business as usual while still using it. Yeah, so, so, so when, you, when you still own, if you will, the, the radical nouns, but you build the syntax around these words, these terminologies in such a way that they communi communi communicate something else. And these are fascinating uh, developments in the field of imagination as practice, which is our main field. Uh, of operation, even if we, if we deliver lectures to one another and, and write, uh, write academic uh, articles. Brilliant. Thank you. On that note around syntax, poetry, and all sorts of further thoughts we might have, uh, I will bring this to a close. Thank you so much, Maria, for your very rich lecture. Thank you everyone for your engagement. And also thank you to Elena at the University of Wolverhampton who has been invisibly hosting the infrastructure on which we currently interact. Um, I will put in the chat a link to, so that if you want to come to future lectures, you can. The next lecture will be on the 8th of July, same time, same process of sign up. Um, we hope you join us. Thank you so much. <laughs>